Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking a Red Bull and vodka. What are you having, Jenny? I'm drinking a gin and tonic. Today, we're talking about the attack on Nancy Kerrigan and the aftermath. On January 6, 1994, 25-year-old figure skater Nancy Kerrigan was practicing for the U.S. Figure Skating Championships at the Kobo Arena in Detroit, Michigan. A camera crew was there filming her practice. Shortly after Kerrigan stepped off the ice, a man followed behind her and hit her with a baton on her lower right thigh and knee. Arena staff rushed to her aid and the camera crew began filming again. Their crew recorded the now famous footage of Kerrigan crying and repeatedly asking, why, why me? Photos of Kerrigan crying in pain made national headlines. Thankfully, Kerrigan did not have any broken bones and her thigh and knee were only bruised. However, with the U.S. Figure Skating Championships just two days away, she was forced to exit the competition because of her injuries. On January 8th, the championships took place and Kerrigan's rival, 24-year-old Tanya Harding, won gold in the title of champion. This guaranteed her a place in the Winter Olympics in Lillehammer, Norway, which were only a month away. After the competition, Harding returned home to Portland, Oregon with her bodyguard, Sean Eckert. Out of support, Kerrigan was also offered a spot on the 1994 Olympic figure skating team. As she recovered, she worked with police to create a composite sketch of her attacker. The attack on Kerrigan appeared to be an obvious way to get Kerrigan out of the competition. She had been the 1993 U.S. figure skating champion and was sure to place in the Olympics. But who would have planned the attack? Many pointed the finger at Tanya Harding and media camped out in front of Harding's home. Harding had earned her first national title in 1991 at the U.S. Figure Skating Championships, where she competed against Kerrigan and placed higher. At the same competition, Harding made headlines by becoming the first American woman to complete a triple axel in a competition. She later took home a silver medal at the World Championships and placed fourth at the 1992 Winter Olympics in Albertville, France, while Kerrigan placed third and earned a bronze medal. By 1994, they had been competing against each other for years and seemed to be rivals. The FBI got involved and began investigating Eckert and Harding's ex-husband, Jeff Galuli. A Portland, Oregon minister had told investigators he'd heard of a tape of Eckert, Galuli, and friend Shane Stant discussing the quote-unquote hit on Kerrigan. Several days after the attack, Harding was interviewed by a Portland news station. During the interview, Harding said she was cooperating with the FBI and that she had quote-unquote nothing to hide and that she wanted the perpetrator caught. The following day on January 12th, Eckert confessed his involvement in the attack and implicated Harding, Galuli, Stant, who was the assailant during the attack, and Stant's uncle, Derek Smith, who drove the getaway car. Authorities in Oregon then arrested Eckert and Smith, charging them with conspiracy to commit second-degree assault. Two days later, Stant surrendered to the FBI and was charged with conspiring to assault Kerrigan. As the investigation continued, the United States Figure Skating Association began discussing whether or not Harding should compete in the upcoming election. Olympic Games. They decided to allow her to compete because she had repeatedly denied any involvement in the crime and there was no evidence to show otherwise. Around the same time, Kerrigan returned to practice. On January 18th, after meeting with investigators for hours, Harding separated from Galuli. The pair first married in 1990 and divorced in August 1993 and rekindled their relationship just a few months later. Claims of Galuli threatening Harding on several occasions during their marriage also surfaced around this time. Harding continued to claim she was innocent and spent her time training for the Olympics. Not long after, Galuli turned himself into the FBI after they issued a warrant for his arrest and eventually confessed to being the ring leader behind Kerrigan's assault. During his confession, he further implicated Harding, Eckert, Stant, and Smith. On January 27th, Harding read a statement admitting she failed to report things she knew about the assault on Kerrigan after returning home from nationals, saying, quote, despite my mistake and rough edges, I have done nothing to violate the standards of excellence in sportsmanship that are expected in an Olympic athlete, end quote. The case against Harding continued growing. 
Galuli stated she had approved of Kerrigan's assault and a Portland restaurant owner turned in trash from his garbage that belonged to Galuli and Harding. The trash contained notes written by Harding, including the telephone number of Kerrigan's practice arena. Due to this new evidence, the U.S. Figure Skating Association met to discuss Harding. They scheduled a disciplinary hearing and gave Harding 30 days to respond to charges that she did something detrimental to the welfare of figure skating. Harding sued the U.S. Olympic Committee to stop it from a planned hearing to discuss whether she should participate in the Olympics. The judge asked Harding and the committee to come to a compromise. Harding eventually dropped her lawsuit and she was allowed to compete. The 1994 Olympics began on February 12th and ratings skyrocketed due to the figure skating scandal. Harding struggled and during her first artistic performance, she stopped due to a broken skate lace. She placed eighth in the competition while Kerrigan won a silver medal. Several weeks after the Olympics, Harding pled guilty to conspiracy to hinder prosecution in a Portland court. A judge placed her on probation for three years and ordered her to pay $160,000 in fines and contributions. She also begrudgingly agreed to resign from the United States Figure Skating Association. Five days later, a grand jury indicted Eckert, Smith, and Stan on several charges, including racketeering and conspiracy to commit second-degree assault. They initially pled not guilty, but later changed their pleas and were all given 18-month prison sentences. Galuli would later be sentenced to two years in prison and fined $100,000 for racketeering. In June of 1994, Harding was stripped of her 1994 National Figure Skating title and banned for life from the U.S. Figure Skating Association. Controversy continued to surround Harding. That same year, pictures taken from the video of her and Galuli's wedding night appeared in the 25th anniversary issue of Penthouse magazine. The tape was later distributed by Penthouse and Galuli and Harding both profited. In October 1994, her fan club began disbanding after financial disagreements. In 1997, Harding performed before a Reno Renegades hockey game, but was booed, catcalled, and had batons thrown at her. In 1999, Harding claimed she had been cleared to return to skating, but the U.S. Figure Skating Association officials said that her status was not changed. Later that year, Harding made her professional skating debut in the Pro Skating Championships in Huntington, West Virginia. Harding would later go on to become a boxer, a reality TV personality, and held various other jobs, including welder. She married twice more after Galuli and gave birth to her son Gordon in 2011. Controversy also followed Kerrigan following the assault. A TV crew seemingly caught her complaining about Oksana Bayol, who had placed higher than her at the 1994 Olympics and won gold. Kerrigan assumed she was waiting on Bayul to get her makeup touched up for the Olympic ceremony, and she was heard saying, quote, oh, come on, so she's going to get out here and cry again? What's the difference? End quote. She also upset many after leaving the Olympics early and not attending the closing ceremonies. Following the Olympics, Kerrigan drew negative attention once again when she was caught saying, quote, this is so corny, this is so dumb, I hate it, this is the most corny thing I've ever done, end quote, as she sat next to Mickey Mouse during a prearranged publicity parade at Walt Disney World. Kerrigan would later say her comments were taken out of context and that she was commenting on her manager's insistence that she wear her silver medal during the parade rather than commenting on the parade itself. She retired from skating in 1994, and in 1995, she married her agent, Jerry Solomon, and the couple later had three children together. In 2004, she was inducted into the U.S. Figure Skating Hall of Fame, and during an ABC News interview in 2017, she claimed she never received a direct apology from Tanya Harding. Del, what are your thoughts on Kerrigan's assault and everyone involved in it? I remember following this story as it was developing. I think this story is the perfect example of what not to do when you're trying to get ahead. I think that Harding should have one just never did it to start with i think that tanya's biggest downfall was the fact that she repeatedly lied about her involvement in this and then she was working with a bunch of idiots we had talked about this earlier how these were not the smartest group of individuals that were putting together this conspiracy And so when you're working with people who are not that bright and are always trying to find a way to get themselves a better deal, that's what you're going to have. You're going to have a bunch of people tattling on each other. So while, yes, eventually it turned out okay for her, I do think that 
her legacy is forever tarnished by this incident. I don't think that anyone can talk about her career without bringing this up. And that's a shame because she was a great figure skater. She was amazing. And the fact that she is forever tied to taking out her competition with a crowbar, so to speak, and you hate to see the fact that, unfortunately, it looks like she's never going to get into the Hall of Fame. And when it comes to Nancy Kerrigan, I do think that she definitely probably had a really sour attitude. I think that she was as competitive as Tanya Harding. However, because she's the victim in the case, I think that her competitiveness and her comment tend to get a pass because they're like, well, she's the victim. We shouldn't do anything to, you know, be too harsh on the victim. But I think it is fair to bring up the fact that it could have easily been her doing the exact same thing to Tanya Harding if the shoe was on the other foot and she wanted to find a way to ensure that she was going to make it into the Olympics and do well there. What are your thoughts? I pretty much agree. I really feel for both Tanya and Nancy. And it does seem like both of their careers really just come down to this one moment in 1994. I feel for Tanya, I guess there are some questions of whether she really was involved because people have said she didn't directly put out a hit. Shane Stant has said that she never said, I want this done to Nancy. But then if there are like notes in her handwriting, I think she probably did know more than she let on. And I agree if she was honest from the beginning, things probably would have turned out more in her favor. And it really is a shame that she was so talented and it kind of all got thrown away and swept away because of something she didn't even necessarily do herself even. It was something that her trash ex-husband did. And like you said, everyone involved, I don't want to call them dumb, but they left a really long paper trail. And Shane Stant, he was interviewed by Inside Edition and he admitted it. He said that the way that they're portrayed in the movie I, Tanya, if anyone has ever seen that, which is not very flattering, it really makes Eckert and Gululi and himself look like idiots. He said that was an accurate portrayal because I guess they really weren't thinking things through. You can see as we're reading, these dates are all very close together where the FBI started talking to Ecker and then he implicated all of these people and then the FBI arrested these people and this person surrendered. Everything moved really fast because of this paper trail that they had left behind. I think it's kind of interesting that Tanya never really made a comeback. I think she sort of did recently with the I, Tanya movie, but at the same time, America, we love an underdog, but being violent towards someone else, I guess, is where we draw the line. She's not the only Olympian that's ever cheated, and she's not going to be the last. So with that being said, let's get into our discussion and get a little deeper into the media portrayal of Nancy and Tanya. Since the assault in 1994, several researchers have actually published analysis on the media scrutiny both Tanya and Nancy faced. The media pitted Tanya and Nancy against each other as competitive rivals since Kerrigan began to grow more popular and successful in competition than Tanya did. Tanya's socioeconomic status was focused on in the media quite often. Her family did not have much money and her mom would often work two to three jobs at a time. Tanya made her own skating costumes and did not receive sponsorships while Nancy skated in designer outfits and had plenty of endorsements. People essentially viewed Tanya as white trash, which her mom would later say that Tanya herself would call her and her family white trash or trailer trash. And part of why she had this reputation was in part due to her hobbies and interests that included hunting and fishing. Because of this, she was also really seen as an outsider in the skating world. Harding was viewed as a quote unquote tomboy in the hyper feminine and refined world of figure skating. Tanya was mocked for years after the attack on Nancy. Her and her husband were parodied on Saturday Night Live, and the mocking continued even after details of the abuse from her husband and brother came out. She was labeled as, quote, the most disgraced figure skater, end quote. In contrast, Nancy was viewed as the squeaky clean good girl. Quote, she was beautiful without being sexual, strong without being intimidating, and vulnerable without being weak, end quote. This did change after the assault and her image faced a quote-unquote meltdown. This meltdown included what we had mentioned earlier, the comments at the Disney parade and the comments about Oksana Bayul. I think some people really seem to turn on Nancy, which I think is very interesting how people can go from a victim to everyone kind of being against you afterward. I think people thought of her comments as kind of bratty and ungrateful. Because of all the media pressure and 
scrutiny that she faced, that's why she did retire so early in 1994. Del, do you have any thoughts on how the media treated both Tanya and Nancy? I think that it's always sad that the media thrives on creating rivalries. If you look at most sports, that's what makes money. And so it's no surprise to me that even in a sport like figure skating, that you have these two women being pit against each other just to sell more newspapers and to get more eyes on the sport instead of letting their talent show for itself. I think it's a shame that Tanya was mocked for her social economic status. That's always wrong, no matter how prominent the person is. I don't think that it's okay to label her as white trash simply because of the things that she enjoys. They always want to place people into a certain and box based on their profession like well you're a figure skater so you need to be this feminine hyper sexualized person and it's like no she does not she just needs to do great at her job I do think that the criticisms of Nancy were a bit unfair. Everyone has their moments. You know, it just turns out that hers were a lot more public than most of ours. What do you think? I think the issue with that is that she got caught, really, because I'm sure that this is stuff that people say about their competition all the time backstage to their agents, their managers, their friends in their head. Nancy just got caught. The Disney thing. I'm a Disney person, so I'd be so excited to be on a a parade float with Mickey Mouse. But I understand, you know, it's not everybody's cup of tea. She did say that she was complaining about wearing her silver medal and how her parents taught her not to show off things like that. So take with that what you will. I really feel for them both. We see so many, you know, women pitted against each other in the media, and I'm so over that. But this all kind of reminds me of how, I don't know what it was, but the 90s was just an awful time for women in the media. I mean, leading up to it, even now it's not that great, but we had Tanya and Nancy, we had Lorena Bobbitt, we had Monica Lewinsky, and we had Anita Hill, and they were all just being totally mistreated. And I know we can't compare all of these cases and say that they were all really similar. It seems like the media loves to like rise women up and then just totally bring them down. And it, people really get entertainment off of that. So going off of that, we'll talk about a few other Olympic scandals that happened. So the first is the Chinese gymnasts that were lying about their ages. There have been at least two instances of Chinese Olympic gymnasts falsifying their ages to compete. Dong Fao Xiao, who registered her age as 17, won a bronze medal during the 2000 Olympic Games in Sydney, Australia. Keep in mind that 16 is the minimum age to compete within the Olympics. Eight years later, it was discovered that she falsified her age and was actually 14 at the time she competed. She was then stripped of her bronze medal. Then, during the 2008 Olympic Games in Beijing, China, the ages of three Chinese gymnasts came into question due to their very young appearances. The New York Times investigated and discovered that gymnast Hei Kishin was only 14 years old, and they also discovered a really big cover-up within the Chinese Olympic Committee. The next case is that of Lochte Gate. During the 2016 Olympic Games in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, Ryan Lochte and three other members of the U.S. swim team claimed they were robbed at gunpoint by men impersonating police officers during a night out in Rio. An investigation quickly showed that the swimmers were lying and in reality Lochte and the other swimmers were confronted by security guards after vandalizing a gas station bathroom. Many Brazilians were angered and claimed that it upheld a negative stereotype of their country. On August 25, 2016, Lochte was charged by real police for falsely reporting a crime. The charges were eventually dismissed in July of 2021. And the last case we're going to look at is that of Oscar Pistorius. In 2012, South African sprinter Oscar Pistorius became the first ever double amputee to compete at the Olympics. Though he didn't win any medals, he was viewed as an inspiration and gained notoriety. This changed in February 2013 when Pistorius shot and killed his girlfriend, Riva Stein, in his home. He admitted to shooting her four times only because he believed she was an intruder. In September 2014, a judge found him not guilty of murder, but guilty of culpable homicide and guilty of reckless endangerment with a firearm at a restaurant in a separate incident. 
he was sentenced to five years in prison. In October 2015, he was released on house arrest, but in December 2015, the Supreme Court of Appeals overturned the culpable homicide verdict and found Pistorius guilty of murder, believing he should have known that firing his gun would have killed. His sentence was originally set at six years, but that was increased to 13 years in prison. That wraps up this week's case. Thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments what you think about Tanya Harding and the attack on Nancy Kerrigan. You can read more about this case and how to support us in the links below. We will be back next week with a brand new episode focused on the Otaku murders. As always, stay safe.